While our next speaker is getting set up, uh, I'll introduce him as he, as he works. So um, our next speaker is uh, Dave Paglarini. And uh, Dave uh, came to Wisconsin, I think, in 2008 and uh, was interested in buying a mass spectrometer for his group. And 2009. 2009. Is that right? Yeah. 2009. Uh, almost 10 years. And, uh, and we talked, and, and uh, he had come from um, a postdoc at the Broad Institute with Vamsi Mutha and had used mass spectrometry in his postdoctoral work to characterize and catalog the contents of mitochondria, the protein contents, and try to figure out which proteins go to mitochondria. And uh, so he came here with this uh, understanding that mass spectrometry was going to be a big part of his biochemistry program. And over the years, we've worked together quite a bit, and uh, now we have several grants together, including um, the National Center, the P41 Center that sponsors part of this program. And you know, I've worked with a lot of biochemists and a lot of researchers uh, in our in a collaborative way. And you know, it it's uh, Dave has a a way of thinking about how to leverage mass spectrometry to really benefit biology in a way that's pretty unique. And um, so I asked him today to, to give you a lecture about, a tutorial lecture about how, how to think about designing an experiment. If you want to learn, you want to learn about biology, you want to learn something, uh, he's one of the best people I've ever worked with at sort of setting up an experiment so that when we get data, we can understand something about that system. And, and um, you know, some people come and say, I've got a urine full of freezer, won't you analyze it for me? And you say, well, what are we going to find? And they don't, they're not sure, right? Uh, so you, so I, I hope that uh, in this week you can, you can go home with also a perspective about, um, you know, what, what do I want to put in a mass spectrometer and how would I set that up? So Dave, it's all you. Thanks. That's the bar high for you. I know. <laughs> I know. Thanks, Josh. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to, to give a, a talk here at this uh, this meeting, and you really, I, I think, as Josh said, what my goal here is to talk a bit, of, I guess, about experimental design, but really through the lens of just some of the biology that, that we've done over the years. And I think before even talking about experiments, I think it's important to note that what you really need in <laughs> the design is our scientists uh, talking to each other. Uh, I, I am not a uh, formally trained mass spectrometrist. I've, I've learned a lot over the years by how to apply it, and you know, I, I, I learned from meetings like this, and through through collaborating a lot with uh, people like Josh, and so and, and and hopefully vice versa. And I think one of the reasons why we have had a productive uh, relationship for these last nine years now is is not only that we talk a lot, but our our students and our laboratories. Uh, do the same, and so we have l biologists and uh, biochemists in my group that really develop relationships and friendships with people in, in his group, and we're always, and we sit in each other's thesis committees, and so it, I think it's really essential that people, we, everybody talks about interdisciplinary science, but the really the way you do it is spending a lot of time, logging a lot of hours, and um, you know, we could come to his group with new biological problems and think we know the right experimental design, but then really it's not because there's some new technology development, or or he could develop uh, his lab some new some new hammer, but maybe not have the best nail to hit with it just yet. And we could help kind of uh, uh, come up with some things there as well. Uh, so as Josh said, I, I began. I'm more of a, a biochemist and, and a mitochondrial biologist, and, but I dabbled a little bit in, in grad school enough to get a little idea of what mass spec was about. And then uh, during my postdoctoral time is really the close collaboration with Steve Carr's group at the Broad Institute where I think I really developed an appreciation of what you can do with mass spec. And the first thing we, we ended up doing was really uh, defining what mitochondria were, were made of. I stumbled into the organelle. There was a protein I was studying and no idea it was mitochondrial until I accidentally discovered that. As a grad student, I got really interested in what other proteins were there. and so. And this was in 2000, it was published in 2008, but um, you know, doing the work earlier than that, back starting in 2005 and six, 
And so we began using mass spec across many different tissues and using them at, uh, analyzing them at different stages of purity. So already we could look for, for trends of enrichment. And we used lots and lots of mass spec data, not as the final answer, but really as one source of information we can combine computationally through a naive Bayesian program to, uh, to, to rank order the probability of, of mitochondrial, of genes encoding mitochondrial proteins as well as some other sources of information like microscopy came up with a catalog we call mitocarta, which has been really useful to the, uh, to the field. And so uh, I want to kind of frame the high-level problem of my laboratory, what we, try to, what we try to address, and using that as a perspective for subsequently what, what we're going to talk about and how do you, you design experiments or use mass spectrometry to, to help solve this problem. So the overall challenge here is that stemming from that mitocarda work, and you, you heard this earlier from Oliver Fine's talk, that there's many proteins out there whose functions we don't understand. And that was really true for mitochondria. We still, like a reasonable estimate is right now about a qu good quarter of the proteins that are mitochondrial, we don't know what they do. Uh, so we call those MXPs for short. Um, so there's lots of them. There's a few hundred of them. Additionally, there are pathways and processes that we've known about for many years. We know that some molecule is turned from this molecule to that molecule. We know that biochemical transformation takes place. We don't know what enzyme belongs there. So you have known pathways that are incompletely annotated. And sort of the third uh, guiding fact is that many mitochondrial diseases, and there's lots of them, are unresolved. And what we mean is that we don't know what the underlying causal variant is, even when we know what the disrupted process is. So if you have a clearly the defect in the first complex of oxidative phosphorylation, you can look for the usual suspects, but often those aren't the culprits. So we know that there's other proteins probably in this bin. So from the high-level perspective, we try to systematically identify functions for these proteins, plug them into pathways and processes, and see if they can underlie some of these unresolved diseases. So how does, I guess during the course of my talk, uh, the point will be how can mass spectrometry help you do this? And it's, again, this is more of a biologist perspective coming at it from the problem versus um, maybe what the latest uh, uh, technology is. But in, you know, in thinking back about these, the various projects we've been doing together for years, I guess there are a few things that uh, have, have popped in my mind. So I'll, I'll list a few just points out here, and then hopefully we come back to those as I progress through the talk. But uh, so the first thing I'm convinced of, and this I think is something people will agree with, is that you know I'm amazed at how fast mass spectrometry has progressed even since I started doing the mitocarda work. If you listen to Graham McAllister's talk the other day, it was like, how could you even keep up with all of this? And I think if you're a biologist and you're, you're getting into mass spectrometry, there's so much happening and there's so much new uh, um, instrumentation and, and capabilities that you almost feel like it's too overwhelming and then my, my approach is going to be outdated before I could start. But you know, really, like anything else, more data does not lead to necessarily to better clear conclusions. Sometimes it is. You, sometimes you just need way more data, and way, and, but often it's, um, it's a lot more than that, of course. I've noticed that in the biological community that there's, there, as, the, as you can do more and more, as you can multiplex at higher levels, as you can record more proteins per hour, and, and that there's a tendency to make your experiments go broader, more samples, as Josh said, more more urine samples in the freezer. Uh, there's more, and, and when really often what you need is to leverage that, uh, that en enhanced ability to go deeper. And that was again alluded to in some of the uh, uh, presentations this morning about replication, experimental design. Uh, so broader is not always the answer, even though you can do more. And you know, I like to, uh, <laughs> people complain about data that comes back to them. Again, from the biological uh, community, uh, you know, th there's, I think, and, and Josh and other people have, have lamented this, that people will often show up thinking that this is all easy in mass spectrometry. We just provide lots of samples, we're gonna get lots of data back, and it's gonna be easy. The best mass specs in the world will not fix a bad question, and uh, 
there's a huge onus, I think, on the biological collaborators to, to think about the design and to really prepare the best samples. The, the, uh, the old adage of garbage in, garbage out certainly applies even as the mass specs get better and better. Uh, so something I always think about when designing experiments is how to build contrast within a consistent system. And so what I mean is you really need to pick, you know, which, which variables are going to be are not going to change. You have one cell line, you have one kind of uh, mouse population. But then try to build in contrasting variables as much as you can within that. That could be time, that could be different knockouts, that could be perturbation. Because the reason is binary changes across one condition, I think, can be very, uh, very hard to interpret bio biologically. And when you have multiple contrasts, multiple contrasting states, uh, it's those trends and then and those true outliers that really, I think, are, are, are good at guiding uh, what to do next. So hopefully, again, you'll see this. And in design, uh, I think it was a key question is always, what are you going to do next? Like, what, what does this data, what are the next set of experiments? Because if, if you're because validation is always next at some level and if your validation if your next screen is a knockout mouse boy you got to have a really tight robust deep screen at the front end to get a very reliable hit but if your next screen allows you to screen 300 things it's very different the design's different and p values and q values are really only so only useful in so far as they tell you which 300 things to screen next even if they're kind of on the borderline so what can you do next? What is your uh, capacity for high throughput validation in the next phase? You really need to keep that in mind. Uh, this is something that's probably maybe obvious, maybe not, but we've come back to this again and again. But when you're thinking about the experiments, you know, there's so much capacity in the biological end to develop certain uh, samples, and then there's a certain capacity on the, on the mass spec end to get everything done in one shot. The best experiments that we keep coming back to are the, often the ones where we can get the most out of one whole batch. You know, what, what we actually calibrate this. What is the, like, you know, in a recent, some recent experiments, the magic number was 120. That's how many, that's how many cultures we could actually physically do consistently across one, you know, student's time factoring in needs for like sleeping and eating and things to get it done. It, you know, and, and when, when you have to deal with batch effects, and you do this over and over again. Sometimes you do have to. Um, of course, things get messier and a little bit harder. Uh, and this is a little bit of a maybe a more obscure one, but we've also heard a lot about how there's so many proteins and metabolite, and not much proteins maybe, but many certainly metabolites that maybe aren't as scarred identified yet. Uh, but when you're thinking about what you want to get out of the experiment, you could still make all of this data really work well for you, even if you don't know what the metabolites are. Uh, if you design your experiments in a certain way, that data still becomes very useful. So hopefully you'll see what that is as well. All right, so I want to really now just, just talk about some actual projects we've done. Some of it will get a little bit maybe more biological than, than uh, you've been hearing lately. But, you know, again, it's, um, it's how is deep mass spectrometry data helping us answer a very specific question. So uh, time permitting, I'll tell you about first a story in 2016 about protein-protein interactions. And all of these questions are going to really still rely or center around uh, defining functions for uncharacterized proteins. So one way to do that is through physical protein interactions. Second way is through what we're calling your multi-omics analyses, which is of, uh, of course familiar to all of you. It's very different. You know, it not, no one approach has come close to answering all of our questions. So my interactive, physical interactions, we'll talk about different kind of uh, interactions or associations through this multiomics approach. And if there's time, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some uh, PTM work as well. So protein-protein interactions. This is something we're all familiar with. The quick overview of a des the design here, again, <coughs> excuse me, starting with these um, the fact that there's many uncharacterized mitochondrial proteins. For us, the, the ultimate experiment design was to uh, take 50 of these. 
50 orphan proteins, some controls. Now, this is, this is you know, only 77 proteins. So this is an example I'm talking about. We could do uh, 700 proteins. We have the capabilities to do that. You could do more and more, but we focus more on, on fewer things, but maybe going deeper. We built in some contrasting states here. So we're the same cells, just slightly different immediate condition. This is kind of a trick to force mitochondrial activity. And then also cross uh, cell types. But in those, just in those, through those 77 proteins, uh, there are a thousand affinity enrichment mass spectrometry experiments. So every, every bait that we looked, every protein that we looked at was, was uh, used in 12 different experiments, at least. And so I'll tell you what kind of came out, out of that, why that's important. So this is one example of why doing more things, but also at greater depth, is important in the design. So what I'm showing here is across the, the top, 106 different experiments, so different uh, um, proteins that were IP'd. And then along this axis are the different uh, interacting partners. And you can see immediately that there are but sometimes there are hits that are very specific, and so you really don't need any fancy technology or experimental design to th think that those are probably um, pretty important, although you wouldn't know they were, they were specific unless you did many things. Of course, you have lots of other things up here that are just always showing up. Uh, but again, there's probably really interesting, important hits in there, but there are non-specific or sticky kind of proteins. And then there's many things in the middle who knows uh, if they're if they're good or bad? So how do you how do you work around this? So here here's a more specific example where you have a heat shock protein and it's interacting with every every uh, protein we pull out. Here's one that's very specific. It only act when they're interacting with one other protein. It's not hard. We don't need any kind of fancy design or computational approach to say that's probably important. Of course. That's OXCT1, it's, it's dimerization partner, so that's not very interesting. But here you have a case where there's many hits, not universal, it's, uh, and some varying degree. And so how do you, how do you begin to get at this, um, what's really important in that mix? So building upon some uh, work from Gigi and Harper groups, so, you know, we're using, there's a number of different programs out there to try to uh, separate this wheat from the chaff, if you will. and, and Doing a number, a, lots of experiments, but also at depth, allows you to, to assess a number of different variables. The first is which is, is how unique an interaction is. So how many different uh, uh, bait proteins have you tried, and how many times does that prey uh, uh, come down? So this thing wouldn't really score that well with that. Then you could also assess the reproducibility, and of course, because there's different measurements of, of abundance in mass spectrometry, whether it's peptide spectral matches or, or intensity, you can measure, have some level of, of how uh, to quantify that interaction. And by the end of our experiment, this rather murky looking protein here turned out to have a very specific uh, new interacting partner that was one of the features, features of our paper. It really cleaned it up pretty nicely. And so the important thing is you don't want to throw away data like this that looks rather nonspecific and only going after these things. If your experiment is designed correctly, you could really get at some pretty interesting hits uh, buried in the noise. Uh, so the, all of our data by the end uh, transferred and transformed this very messy looking uh, plot into something much cleaner. Still a lot of validation is, is needed, but uh, uh, it really helped prioritize things. So I'll give you a more specific example of that, but here overall, when you look at all of our data, this is just showing the, the, the cutoff score that we use in that formula and the number of interactions above a certain threshold. So we used our, our uh, controls, control with all their known interactions here to identify a score that, that included 95% of all the positive control interactions. And when we did that, we ended up throwing away almost 95% of, uh, of the data we, we found. So we really, as a way to really uh, uh, focus in on some very high confidence interactions there. So here's an example that I'd like to uh, follow up on further. So this is uh, a protein that is called C17 or 89. 
And that's about as much as anyone knew about it. It's the 17th open or 89th open reading frame on the 17th chromosome. And it was one of these mitochondrial proteins that showed up. It really hadn't, has, hadn't been studied. And when we just took that protein alone and I peed it, we had 1,431 different other proteins coming along. So that's the double-edged sword, I guess, of the high sensitivity mass spectrometers these days. You're really no closer to any kind of interesting uh, or follow-up biology with 1,400 interactors. But by the end of the, 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 the project, um, again, across about 1,000 different experiments, uh, we were able to get down to 10 things that actually looked really much more promising, some of which weren't, weren't obvious uh, by any one metric alone. And the top one, something called INDUF AF5, and it's what we in the mitochondrial field call an assembly factor. So what that means is it's a protein, and I'm showing this in red, that is, is somehow important for the assembly or the maturation of a large complex, in this case this is complex one, uh, but it's not present in the complex at the end. So complex one, and so almost all the oxygen we're breathing right now go to mitochondria to take, uh, take part in oxidative phosphorylation. Complex one is the largest, it's, a, it's about 45 subunits in humans, and um, errors in complex one com collectively comprise the, the most frequent inborn error in metabolism in the world. And to date still, there are some 40% of patients that come to the clinic and we know that this is the problem, Complex one, this NADH dehydrogenase here, where is my cursor, uh, is not working properly, but none of these other subunits seem to be affected. So we know that there are these kind of red proteins that are, are lurking out there, but they're very different, difficult to identify. So this data suggested maybe this is one of those. So we could test that uh, by doing some experiments here where we're looking at cells and how well they respire in the dish. How well, how, how well do they consume oxygen? So this is an oxygen consumption rate. So they just sitting in a cell, they're sitting in a dish, they're, they're, they're consuming a certain amount of oxygen, their mitochondria are working, this is wild type cells. You could do something called uncoupling them, which is like putting your car in neutral and hitting the gas, how many RPMs can you, uh, can you get? Um, and then you could poison complex one and shut it down. So you get this kind of pattern here. Well, if you remove the protein we discovered, you get something that looks a lot like what happens in a mitochondrial disease patient, where they ha still have some respiration. They have no ability to kind of like up their RPMs. They have no what we call spare respiratory capacity. And this happens in patients if they try to walk slowly, they might be fine. If you had to ask them to go up the stairs, then their muscles shut down. So this looked, uh, looked promising. And all I'll show from this complicated blot is that this, this was the interacting partner of this one. And what happens here is that when you, when you knock down uh, the protein we found, its interacting partner goes away. And so that's basically the whole, the whole point of that complex block. So it's really looking kind of like it might be a new assembly factor. Now, I told you that many of these variants are unresolved. So many, many of these diseases. So, that, so now we began to work with geneticists and say, do you have biopsy material and cell lines that that we can look at, and perhaps this has been something that's been missed sequencing-wise. So we, we ended up uh, um, working with a, a group in the UK, in Newcastle, UK, and they said, well, we looked at your gene, and there's a couple of cases where, or there's a case we found where the mother clearly has a mutation, again, this is a, in one of the genes, uh, it's a heterozygous, that knocks the whole gene out of frame, and that would completely shut the protein down, but the other, doesn't seem to be anything wrong in the exons of the other, um, of the other parent. And so, but when we said, you know, this is really looking good, they, they sequenced it further, and they found this, what we call a deep intronic variant, something that sits really deep in the intron, and is not picked up with the exome sequencing. And it looks fairly innocuous, but it turns out for some reason when this uh, mutation occurs, you can lose all expression of the transcript. So, it turns out this patient exhibits what looks like a, a complex one disease. Um, and sure enough, you know, only the complex one is affected, other mitochondrial parameters aren't. You could view the complex physically on a gel and show that in patients it goes away, it never assembles. 
and we could rescue the pathogenicity by reintroducing this little protein back into the cells and complex one activity uh, returns to pretty much wild type levels. This interacting protein, protein comes back. So at this point now, we, we've gone from this obscure little protein, but through, I think, a good you know, experimental design, we've been able to associate it with a specific function and take that all the way to explaining an unresolved human disease. And we now know that this, this disease is occurring in other patients across other clinics across in the US and in Europe. Um, so that's, that's one. That's one example. In that study, of course, there are many other high priority hits that are kind of waiting for their validation for their biological follow-up. Now, many other proteins though, just weren't that inf informative in that study. And that's of course is going to happen. No experimental design is going to be perfect. <coughs> and so at this point, in, in, instead of doing more and more physical protein interactions, we decided to take a different approach for another batch. Um, and this is a multi-omics approach that um, I'd like to tell you about now. A very different strategy. So the same problem here, but now the experimental design is a bit different. Uh, here, what we're doing, again taking 50 of these orphan proteins, this, is all, this one is in yeast, many more controls, and you'll see why. Again, we're building in that contrast through a couple of different growth conditions. Almost any yeast uh, high throughput or large scale study you see in the literature is done in this kind of uh, growth condition, fermentation. But really it's in the respiratory condition when all the sugar has run out that yeast really need to use their mitochondria well. So we focused on, on um, this was actually, this was a variable that took um, us months to work out exactly, to get it right at a phase where when yeast run out of their sugar and they're relying on mitochondria, they, have, they undergo this drastic uh, metabolic change. If their mitochondria don't work, they're going to die. So you want to capture them before they die so you're not measuring dead cells. And you know, if looking back on the whole experimental design, if we didn't get this right, if there were two people that really, uh, one in Josh's group, Alex Hebert, and one in my group, John Steffley, who were just hammering away at this condition because we thought it was so important. It took, took months, but that turned out to be, I think, really the most important variable in the whole experiment. And uh, then profiled as deeply as we could um, prote with using proteomics, metal metabolomics, and lipidomics, really on the heels of some other technology development in Josh's group that uh, the one-hour yeast proteome paper, as you might be familiar with, that really enables to do this pretty quickly. So we call it the Y3K because after all the replicates and the different conditions, we have a, about a thousand, actually a little more than a thousand of each of these. So hence, yeast 3000 or Y3K, lots of biological measurements um, required. So now what do you do with all of this? How is this, how is this helpful? So at a glance, if you summarize all of the data here, what we're looking at across the top are those, it turned out to be 172 strains, started off as 200, but when you start sequencing uh, strains in the, the knockout collection, a number of them drop off, so uh, that's another point, of course. Validate your, your reagents. So 172 different strains, um, and we have them in the two conditions. And then along the y-axis here, all the biological um, molecules that we measured, all the biomolecules we can measure, proteins, lipids, and metabolites. So then the question now is how do you reach into this extremely dense, rich set of data to answer a specific biological question. So as an example of one way we've done this, I'll tell you about one of our favorite molecules, which is coenzyme Q, one of the most hydrophobic molecules in nature. 50 carbons in its tail in humans. It's, an, it's a re redox active um, benzoquinone, and uh, it's really important for that same process. It actually takes electrons from complex one, passes them on down the electron transport chain to complex three. And this little pathway I showed as an example is actually the biosynthesis of coenzyme Q. It's an example that it, coenzyme Q was discovered down the street right here in Madison in the late 50s. And still today, we don't really know how it's made. And if you go to GNC, you can pick up big bottles of coenzyme Q, but it's really not very bioavailable, so it doesn't really get where it needs to go often. A different problem we're working on. But 
we don't really know how it's made. We've known for uh, many years that the isoprenes derive from the mevalonate pathway, the same pathway that gives you uh, the precursors for cholesterol. If you're taking, taking statin drugs, you're also affecting your coenzyme Q pull a bit. We've also known for 40 some years that the head group is derived from tyrosine, but as you can see, we don't know how that happens. We don't know how those precursors are imported into mitochondria, and we don't know some of the steps in the final biosynthesis down to the, coat, the final product. We also know that there are proteins that are in mitochondria that you absolutely need for the pathway. We have no idea why, or very little. We're working on that as well. So if you could just remember for a second this molecule here, PPHB, and this one 4HB, um, I'll show you how we could dig into the data to help answer some of these missing questions, these missing steps. So keep those in mind. Here's a, we're framing the question, a classic biochemical pathway. We don't know fully how it works. There must be proteins around that are helping it. So how can we reach into this data and, and uh, address that? So I'll give you three rather straightforward analyses. There's all kinds of, we could probably spend a lifetime analyzing this data of many different complex means. Keeping it simple, here are three, uh, three straightforward analyses. The first is what we're calling a knockout knockout correlation profile. So recall that many of these strains are proteins of unknown function and many of them, most of them, are proteins of well-established function. That's why we needed so many um, positive controls here. We needed a profile for what every mitochondrial process looked like when we disrupted it. And when we do that now, we can get uh, correlations across all of our measured data. So here, for example, is an, here are two genes that are, we already know are part of the same exact complex in mitochondria. Now what you see, though, is that when we knocked out this, this, uh, this one protein or another, the correlation of the protein was really strong. It wasn't just other members of its complex. It wasn't just mitochondria proteins. It was a really strong overall correlation. And it wasn't just true at the protein level, it was true at the metabolite level and the lipid level. Now most of the time, if you pick two, two different genes, notice this is a different one here, you got no correlation. Of course, that's really important. You can only convince yourself of that if you do it many times. Now, we know these two genes are functionally related, but if we didn't know, the point is that we might infer that. We might say, well, that's we somehow have have caused the cell to be in the same state, has reacted the same way, has modified the proteome and metabolome the same way. And here, these are just pairwise correlations, but if we then color code the strength of the interactions, we can look at many things at once. So we can look at across all of our strains. And this is really small, of course, but this is these are all coenzyme Q related uh, knockouts. But up here is something that no one's really ever studied, and it's clustering with these same things. And, and we test that, and it has a coenzyme Q deficiency for reasons we don't quite understand yet. It's, un, uh, it's, it's an ongoing investigation. But recall that you know, even if these metabolites, even if we don't know what they are, even if we didn't know what any of them were, uh, it's still driving a correlation between unknown things that is motivating very specific follow-up biochemistry. So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about what, what you want to get out of your data. So a second way is a, a covariance uh, analysis. So much like you, people do mRNA co-expression analyses and they want to try to associate genes of known function with, you could, we could do this across all of our data, our protein, metabolite, and lipid data. So here is an example where a, a protein known to be involved in the production of coenzyme Q is anti-correlated with a precursor. When this decreases, the precursor builds up. And we can see that general trend across all of our data. Same with different protein-protein uh, correlations or protein-metabolite correlations. Again, when most things don't have any kind of correlations. So here, even if this protein wasn't part of our study design, if we didn't knock it out, we're measuring it across all of our, uh, of our um, experiments. And so we could create little network diagrams like this. So here's one that says, four uh, members of the coenzyme Q pathway are all positively correlated with each other. That makes sense. They're all negatively correlated with their precursor. You lose those proteins, you build up the precursor. Oh, and by the way, here's some other protein that correlates with these and we don't know why. So that's an example of how we've pulled in an unknown protein 
which was not part of our experimental design, and now have something to follow up on. And we could do this again and again and keep roping in different unknown proteins into known networks that give us a very specific uh, question to follow up on. So the third way that we think about this is if you have a very specific question in mind, a very specific metabolite or molecule, you can see if that is changing in any special way across all of your experiment, all of your strains. So this is our third, our outlier analysis. So here in this uh, volcano plot, every dot is a one of our strains and measure of significance and the, there's some molecule in question. And you can see here that this strain uh, tends to be different than the rest. But you also see that it's actually not a remarkable full change difference. And that if you only did this, you'd probably say, I don't know, it's really not that interesting. But across 172 different strains, it's really stood out. And so we're like, maybe that's actually really important. And that molecule was 4-HB, one of those molecules that derive from tyrosine. I asked you to keep in your head for a few slides. 4-hydroxybenzoate. And the strain is something called HFD1. It doesn't matter what it is. But if you go back to the pathway here, I, this is the direct soluble head, uh, head group precursor that feeds into mitochondria to eventually make coenzyme Q. And we don't know how this is made, but HFD1 is a dehydrogenase, and one, potential, one possibility is it's derived from, the, from the, the, the benzaldehyde precursor. So we could test this in a number of ways, genetically and biochemically. We could say, well, in an HFD1 knockout, does this compound rescue? How about this compound? How about anything else we think is upstream? And it's only when you get to here do you rescue the growth of yeast strains that are sick because of loss of that protein. We could purify the protein and do all the biochemistry and say it does the reactions. Um, and actually now through independent yeast screens and an independent group have validated that this actually is the essential dehydrogenase for this step and we know now what the human orthologs are. And the reason the fold change was so low is because under the normal yeast media conditions, there's another way for the yeast to get there. And when you remove that other uh, alternative route, now you get a big fold change. But uh, because we have, the, we have done so many strains, we're still able to spot that outlier, even though the fold change wasn't remarkable. Um, now, importantly, we talked about being able to explore your data. And uh, this is something that I think is probably one of the most important developments in our collaboration in the, in the last few years is the way Josh's group is now, is now delivers data to a collaborator. It's not, here's a big giant Excel spreadsheet. It's, um, and this is really started by one of the co-leads in this project, Nick um, in a website that we could quickly interrogate the data. As biologists, we could just go in and ask questions over and over and over again. And so here, I'll just show you very quickly how you could, quick, you could reproduce every graph I just showed you in a matter of, of minutes. So here's the website. You can look at the proteome, the metabolome, or the lipidome. And if I just you know, play this video here, we were selecting which knockout strain we want to look at. Select a knockout strain. It's going to tell you all the proteins that are changing across that knockout. You could scroll over and see what they are. Now, if you want to see uh, what, other, the, what other knockouts look the same, you can look at this and see there are other coenzyme Q related proteins here. And if you want to see, like, test specifically what's changing between two knockouts, you can plot that and see that this is, looks very similar to a knockout of another coenzyme Q protein. Now, if you have a, a specific uh, protein of interest, here's, here's a coenzyme Q protein, you could bring up, you know, do the molecular covariance network analysis, recreate that network that pulls in one of these interesting new proteins. Or if you want to search, one of those uh, uh, precursors itself, you could ask, here's a coenzyme Q precursor, how does it change across every knockout that we looked at? Well, okay, here are some positive controls that worked. There's HFD1, that new hit. Here are some things that we know should, should pop up. But now if HFD1, what if you're, you don't know if that's like, is everything messed up in the HFD1 knockout or is it all lipids? You could ask the knockout versus wild type question, put in your, your gene, you could see, well, it's really that's that one lipid that's really particularly changing. And it, you could, the way Nick built it is you could hit a button and download it right into an Illustrator file and you're pretty close to having 
uh, publishable figure. So it's really been a remarkable resource for us, and we continue to find lots of interesting new data uh, in here. Um, I talk about building in contrast. Here is a, here's the reason the fermentation condition is important. Um, in the fermentation condition, there was really one strain that was, that was affecting this pathway quite remarkably, staying with the coenzyme Q example. I uh, can't get this thing to work. Here we go. So coenzyme Q is down. The precursors are up. Uh, I just showed you this very same pathway. This, this strain here is a knockout of an mRNA binding protein. So the, now the hypothesis is, well, maybe this is regulating the expression of, of a, some special coenzyme Q gene. Well, when you look at the predicted targets of PUF3 across all the literature, there's like 2,000 of them. They contain basically all of the predicted coenzyme Q proteins. It's not very useful. But uh, working with not just with Josh's group, but also with a Martha Wickens' group on campus who studies um, this very thing, we're able to combine new approaches. This is just two approaches called um, cross-linking immunoprecipitation and RNA tagging. Uh, to prioritize PUF3 hits, but then to integrate all of our proteomic data that we have here. So if, when, this pro, when this mRNA binding protein is gone, uh, transcripts are activated, it turns up, and so integrating now these three data sets, um, we have a really truncated list of candidates here, and only one of them is in the CoQ pathway. We go on to show that that CoQ5 if, you, if it's expressed at the wrong levels, the pathway gets messed up, the complexes are affected, uh, and um, coenzyme, Q, uh, coenzyme Q levels actually decrease if you, over, if you increase or decrease the levels of this protein. So just one more example. That was a, a very quick example of a complicated paper. Another, um, and the Y3K project is the, where you could uh, explore all of this data. So because this... Uh, this experiment really worked so well for us. We've been coming back to this kind of design. And, but because there are so many strains, we had to deal with all those batch effects. We had multiple chunks of 20. So in subsequent experiments, we've been doing something very similar, but doing it at, with 20 strains at a time and asking more specific questions. So here, the, the question we wanted to answer is, what are the specific substrates of a protease? in mitochondria? And it's kind of a difficult question to ask because proteases, when they're disrupted, could lead to an increase or a decrease in their substrates. If it's, a, if it's a protease that just chews up a substrate, that might decrease. If it's a protease that processes something leading to stability, it could increase. So same exact experimental design. Proteases across the mitochondrion uh, in different compartments. And I want to use just a few slides to again reinforce how this design really, really got us to some answers. Um, all of these are proteases or peptidases, except for uh, some are, some are, are non-mitocontrols. But if you just pick one, here's one, PIM1, and you knock it out and ask, what are all the proteins that change? You get something that looks like this, and it's, it's pretty messy. Some things are going up more than others. Some things are going down. You have some leads. But you might not be super confident that to go after any one of those because there's a lot of stuff happening. And I would argue this will happen in almost any knockout you make at any time. Now, there is an encouragement here because this is one of the known substrates, ISU1. Another hit is interesting, which is ISA1, which is in the same iron sulfur cluster generation pathway. It looks like maybe that'd be something to follow up on. But at this point, if we only had this data I'd argue you still only sort of be marginally encouraged to, to look at this. But because we have all of these, um, all of these proteins, and they all kind of have a similar biochemical function, we can again go back to that outlier analysis and say, is there something special about this strain? So in both cases here, uh, the only time that ISU1 and ISA1 were affected were in the PIM1 knockout. And every other knockout strain really didn't change much at all. So now we've gone, you know, we have two kind of analyses that get us there. It's, it's, the increase, the, the, it's the increase itself, but it's really the fact that it only changes. It's, you, you've given it a background. You have this contrast of other sim similar biochemical activities that just says this is probably something real. Here's another example. It's even maybe more striking. 
uh, in the knockout of this this protease, the volcano plot is not that remarkable. Uh, but there are three things here that make sense for other biological reasons. They're kind of facing the right way, they're in the right place in the mitochondrion. And in every case, those are, are convincing outliers as well. So even though the fold change was low, it only happened in that strain. And that again kind of uh, tells us it's probably real. Um, here's one that we went on, we followed up on in more depth. Oct1, it's called. So we asked, um, again, going back to the coenzyme Q pathway as a single example for you, uh, we asked, is coenzyme Q affected in any of these strains? So it turns out that if you just looked at one strain, you might see some, that a lot of these things might seem like they have some CoQ defect, but one in the log scale really stood out. So OCT1 had this strong CoQ defect. Because we have these different uh, omic planes here, we could look at the precursors in uh, different metabolic precursors and in the proteins, there was, a, there was there were some proteins that were only affected in the OCT1 strain. So it, it motivates a really specific follow-up biological question. OCT1 is known to snip off eight residues from an N-terminus of a protein. Somehow that's really affecting a specific biochemical process. We tested that by taking all known coenzyme Q proteins, pulling them out of wild type or OCT1 delta uh, cells, and just sequencing the N-terminus. And in every case, they were exactly the same except for one. CoQ5 was offset by exactly eight, eight residues. And I won't take you through all the rest of the data that just shows that it, the biochemistry, biochemistry is right on, it performs the activity. When you disrupt that, that site, yeast are sick, they don't make coenzyme Q, that processing point is needed. But really, it was the combination of, of having all of these strains, having the different omic planes that led us to a very specific biochemical question that we could follow up on. So I'm just watching the time because I could talk for a long time. I'll just mention now that, that we're now transitioning this to uh, human cells. So right now we have um, 116 individual CRISPR knockout lines, up 200 uh, lines total with, with biological replicates. We're doing a very similar experimental design now, and, we're, and, we're, um, and it's, it's looking really promising. Here's one quick example, uh, staying with the same uh, biology. All the positive controls for coenzyme Q look good in these cells. Many things don't look affected. Here's one random protein that all of a sudden has loss of, of coenzyme Q. Uh, on the proteomic level, a few things are affected in the pathway, protein-wise, not all of them. Um, a second thing that's affected is complex one, that same complex, and again, it's unique. It just stands out in this one strain. And um, now we can layer this back onto our protein-protein interaction data and say that these things that are changing in human cells actually physically interact with one another in our earlier data set. And this weird little protein um, is actually now, going back to our genetics collaborators, we actually now found that it underlies a second uh, unresolved case of mitochondrial dysfunction. So this overall approach is, is one that, uh, this multi-omics approach is one that we keep really coming back to again and again, designing new experiments we keep learning about the experimental design, and it's really, I think, um, really bearing a lot of good fruit for us. Um, I think in order to keep it on time, I won't talk too much about uh, the phosphoproteomics work, but we've done a lot in this area as well, and just building on some of the stuff that uh, Andy uh, Tao was talking about uh, earlier in the meeting, um, using some of that, that same technology to identify how PTMs are changing in mitochondria, how to associate that with very specific proteins, um, phosphatases in particular across the mitochondria, but I won't, I won't take you through this, uh, through this data as well. Um, so, so that you're not uh, saturated with biology, I'll just thank my, my team here, uh, a few others that uh, uh, recently graduated and um, we'd work a lot with Josh's group, as I've mentioned, and some other um, biologists both here in Madison and collaborators in, the, in Newcastle in the UK. We have another meeting next month. This one's, uh, uh, I, I get to take the lead on this one. It's all uh, very much metabolism focused. And so if you wanna come back to Madison for a lot more uh, metabolism and some mitochondrial stuff, here's how you register for that. Uh, some funding, happy to 
answer any questions. Thanks.